Imagine a year when Tim Burton remakes a movie and it's bad. What year is that, Zach? Is it 2010 or 2019 or is it or is it 2005? The year is 2001. One. 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 Welcome to Oldie But A Goodie, the podcast talking about movies from 2001 in the order they came out in. We are almost at the end of blockbuster season right now, uh, pro- probably the last big blockbuster we're going to do this year. So we're going off with a bang, and by a bang, I mean Planet of the Apes 2001, the film no one remembers from this franchise. My name is Sandro, I'm joined by Zach. I really hope nothing's banging. What? Um, oh, you mean the, yes. Yeah, I mean the main characters. I've got some theories about the romance in this movie, actually, about um, about uh, some stuff that maybe should have been cut, but then wasn't, and then stuff oh. that was cut. Ooh. But first, got to introduce our, uh, our guest and our friend. He's been on the show a lot. It's Rob Lloyd. You're back. Hello. Oh, thank you so much for bringing me back to uh, talk about this abomination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you... Ah, uh, the biggest Planet of the Apes fan I know, I think. Look, if there's anyone uh, bigger into Planet of the Apes than me, I'd like to test their credentials. Because you are talking to the fan who decided to base their Year 12 major artwork on the Planet of the Apes original film series, particularly Ooh. the themes of science versus religion. I have adored the films. Roddy McDowell, who was the lead for uh, most of the original films, is one of my favourite actors of all time. Uh, and so, yeah, that was leading me in. I was, I'd, I'd heard the rumours of the Planet of the Apes being remade or rebooted in the 80s and the 90s. And so it was you know, a long time coming. Uh, when they finally brought back uh, Planet of the Apes with the pedigree that is, you know, uh, Tim Burton, a, you know, a score by Danny Elfman and, you know, the likes of Tim Roth, who who turned down a little new film franchise possibly starting called Harry Potter. He turned that down to do this film. Ah, sounds garbage. Sounds trash. Sounds unprofitable. Helen Bottom Carter's involved. You've got... Mark Wahlberg, and I'll go into my thoughts on Mark Wahlberg later on, and then not bringing back Roddy McDowell for a significant role, but bringing back Charlton Gun-loving Eston. Oh, there's so much, so much hope. And then to have it all taken away, it's, uh, it's the, it's, that's the representation of 2001 Planet of the Apes. Oh, and of course, there's a Rick Baker as well. Also, a big shout out to, uh, the Rick Baker. Look, those who do well in this f- film do incredibly well. Those who do bad do appalling. Yeah, I feel like this movie is um technically good in terms of the technicals of the film. Technically, it looks good. Technically, oh, yeah. it sounds good. Technically, the plot is fine. Uh, however, it's also really bad and boring. Zach, what did you think? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, well, you did a full 180 there. Um, I think it, I agree. It looked fantastic. I love the... Um, the sort of the makeup, the costumes, the uh, yeah. the setting, the jungle, you know, the weird space storm of time manipulation, like uh, the Star Trek storm, all of it. Yeah. The story I had a I had a few gripes with. You say the story was good? Mm, I don't I don't know. Like it's possible. Yeah. It was like if it was maybe an episode of Star Trek. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. This was this was a Star Trek episode, which, <laughs> as we know from watching uh, many a Star Trek movie, it's not necessarily a good thing that a Star Trek episode is a movie. No, <laughs> no. Most of the the Star Trek movies that are just long episodes, they're the bad ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I will, I will, I will interject here. I will go to bat. <laughs> I will go to bat for one of those movies that people constantly describe as just a telly movie on the big screen. I will mm-hmm. live and die 
by uh, Star Trek Insurrection. I really like that. Insurrection. Film. What's that one? Insurrection. That's the one with not not erection. That's a different type of movie, Sandra. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> that's no. the one that Sandra directed you. To, uh, that um, that Zach directed you towards. <laughs> I directed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Look, there are a lot of sexy apes in that one. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Insurrection is the one where it's sort of like the the fountain of youth. So there's a planet that's covered in uh, sort of like a, protec- a particular protective shield, and that creates chemicals and enzymes that uh, those people who live on there have eternal youth. Mm, and so it's yes. sort of like the, the Federation want to uh, pool all its resources, whereas the Enterprise crew go, um, this is not what the Federation is meant to do. And they cause an insurrection going against the Federation to save the people of that planet. Okay. Yeah, actually, mm. I think I think I did like that one when I was going through all those films for the first time. I liked that one, but probably because Nemesis comes after it. Uh, and, um, <laughs> well, Nemesis Nemesis breaks the theory that every odd Star Trek movie is crap and every even one is is amazing because that was Star Trek X and it is bad. Yeah, they accidentally swapped the two ones. They did. They, it, it's, it's a common mistake. They lost the numbers behind the sofa, pulled them out, and yeah, they got them mixed yeah. up. Oh, but then they made... Uh, wait, no, Generations was... Before, and never mind. I don't remember which Star Trek <laughs> movies which. <laughs> yeah, that's how good the 2001 Planet of the Apes is. So good that we're talking about another <laughs> film. We'd much rather talk about Star Trek movies instead. Well, that is, of course, because um, the rewrites for this film were done by uh, some people that wrote some of the best Star Trek films, actually. But we'll get mm. into that when we go through how this movie was made. It's a long story. Uh, but, Zach, you picked this. <laughs> and usually when someone picks a movie that's a remake or a sequel, they go and rewatch the first one. But we forgot that that's something we do. Yeah. And I didn't tell you to go rewatch the first one. But, like, we've already seen it, so it's fine. I've, I've watched Planet of the Apes before, you know. Yeah. And I was thinking, I really liked your, your point on the religious aspect of that film. Because I remember that's, that's like, a whole big thing. Oh, in the original film, it's a massive thing yeah. about, like, the scientists, uh, Cornelius and Zira, uh, yeah. so, like, are, are hamstrung by the government that is religiously based. So, like, the government, you know, church and state have been pretty much obliterated the church is the state and the scientists are just controlled by the church and so everyone is you know it's a religious uh society all founded on the belief of the lawgiver and all that stuff and so when this anomaly taylor comes into the picture it throws their whole society at risk and it challenges everything and they kind of sacrifice a lot of that they do have like boring table scenes with monkeys just eating food <laughs> and talking about politics. Yeah. Oh, I loved that. It, it reminded me of the prequels. It brought me back to my childhood. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say. That's what Star Wars did, and everyone loved that. <laughs> but they sacrificed a lot of that deeper script writing that was brought in in the 60s with the great work of Rod Serling and stuff like that to just... Um, but tr- it, it's like a blockbuster, but there's not much in the way of like quality action in it because Burton Burton isn't 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 known for his you know well choreographed uh, fight sequences or big ex- events so yeah it's like in because I remember when I first saw this as a kid I was bored because the action's bad and it's not very interesting also for a blockbuster comparing it to last week's Jurassic Park 3 which I also didn't like as a kid but like looking back on it that holds your attention because you know it's just non-stop tension non-stop action this is like a bunch of board scenes and then very poorly choreographed fist fights well it's yeah like <laughs> the original film I'm going to be I'm going to be that that guy the original film your lead character is done with humanity and there's a whole speech at the start going, humanity is sick. I don't care about humanity at all. I'm like cynical and have this this approach to where society is. And he leaves because he's just done with it. Go, I don't ever get to come back. Sweet. I don't. I hate humanity. And then he finds himself in a place where his humanity is something he has to fight for. That is incredible to see. Someone who was so cynical and against what he is and where he comes from and he fights so hard when he's challenged for it to to find that struggle for humanity it's a wonderful sight to see he still stays stays quite cynical and stuff like that but there's this drive to him to go no actually screw you there is some 
essence of humanity. And that moment where he turns to Zaius and goes, this proves that man was here and he was better than you. Coming from the guy who at the start of the films, they're going, humanity sucks. It's it's really interesting. Where in this, you've got a really annoying guy who won't, you know, he's, he's, he's pretty much the same character in every movie he does, Marky Mark, but he almost sounds like his character from the, uh, the other guys going, I'm a peacock, you've got to let me fly. <laughs> yeah, man. What? What do you mean? <laughs> We're watching the same movies? At one point, he talks about how they caged monkeys. That's right. So I, I, I don't, I think we watch different movies. <laughs> that sounds exactly like the same guy I watched in this film. Yeah. He does come back in a post-credit scenes with a mustache, though, so I'll forgive him mm. for, for... That's an uncharted <laughs> reference to Ha-ha. no one who watched that movie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I was, uh, there, I was actually there going... I actually stayed to the end of the... I, I, I kept on fast-forwarding to the end of the credits just to make sure if there was a post credit scene. Mm. And I'm there going... No, it just cut out when I watched it. They go, oh, it's Uncharted. Oh, I didn't even see that. Yeah. Uncharted reference, yeah. That uh, that film was actually not bad. I enjoyed it. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash oldie, but a goodie for the review of that. <laughs> All right, Zach, you picked this. You had a bunch of other options um, of films that came out this week in 2001. Two of them I'm very annoyed that you didn't pick, but those two are not Green Fingers, which is a British comedy about prisoners growing a garden. Looks more like a TV film. It's probably fine. But I am annoyed that you didn't pick Spirited Away. Hey. Yeah, I know, but it's it's too good for this podcast, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, then maybe we needed some trash, like Wet Hot American Summer, my favourite <laughs> comedy movie, came out this week in 2001, Zach. It all comes around, it all comes back to that, Sandro. This is your big master plan, this is your Andrew Cartmill plan, if you, if you forgive the 1980s Doctor Who reference. <laughs> but you see... Planet of the Apes. <laughs> oh, that's right. We're going to go back to talking about this film. Shit. Yeah, that's right. Something, something, Planet of the Apes. Also, I think it, it, it's going to make a great podcast. We it got will. Some great ideas. Um, I don't really have much more excuses. I just kind of <laughs> wanted to annoy you by not picking it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, okay. There's one thing that I will say. There's a lot of people who are up for this, uh, for the lead role and stuff like that. And so everyone, everyone should know that Tim Roth, who plays Thade, turned down playing Snape in Philosopher's Stone so he could do this. And so what Tim, Lo- Tim Roth's loss was, was our gain because we got the great Alan Rickman. Yeah, which was good. And just like Tim Roth, uh, Zach has chosen to not do a good film and <laughs> do a bad film. But uh, Mark Wahlberg was up for the role of Linus in Ocean's Eleven, oh. but he turned, it, he turned it down to do this. So I'm thankful for that because Matt Damon is so much better in Ocean's Eleven and that film would have been completely ruined because all the cast are incredible and it would have been ruined if it had that drag factor of Mark Wahlberg. So I'm willing to sacrifice my love of Planet of the Apes because it was a doomed film anyway uh, so that I could get at least Ocean's Eleven with the perfect cast. Which is an incredible film. That does come out in 2001. Will we review it? Not if Zach's picking that week <laughs> <laughs> the grudge is forever all right uh, this film was released uh this wow. film was released july 27th it is of course directed by tim burton a pretty highly sought after director in 2001 i think i mean he just on sleepy hollow but i feel like i feel like this is when tim burton's style started to go away because every film before this has that, you know, classic, creepy, weird Tim Burton style. Um, even Mars Attacks. But then after this, it's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, Alice in Wonderland, or and then we get to Dumbo, which has got no personality at all. I feel like this is kind of the start of that that downward spiral that he went on. Yeah, it's interesting watching the opening of this film because it very much is an exact copy of his opening credit design for Batman. Yeah. So it's sort of like bring the credits up as you go through this particular thing. And as you pan out, you see, oh, it's an ape's helmet. And then the eyes open. Oh, yeah. Like at the end. It's sort of like, this is about the apes. And then at the end of the Batman one, it's this is about Batman. So it's the exact same style. Mm. So you could see it's sort of like he's not, you could see he's not really emotionally or artistically invested in this. So he's just rehashing stuff he's done before. But before he was involved, there was a lot of other versions that this film went through. Uh, You mentioned earlier, Rob, that discussions for a, well, what was originally a sequel to the original five movies that started in the late 80s with a uh, story, Return to the Planet of the Apes. Tom Cruise 
was in talks to be in it. Uh, Peter Jackson was involved in some way. I think Sam Raimi was being considered to direct. Uh, Oliver Stone at some point. Uh, Arnie Schwarzenegger as well, so... Yeah, he ended up taking the lead once they had a script from Terry Hayes, which is a very interesting script. It's about a plague, um, a monkey in a spaceship, or, well, an ape, sorry, uh, lands on Earth, spreads a plague, and they're like, we've got to time travel back to the Stone Age. So a bunch of humans time travel back to the Stone Age, uh, where apes are at war with cavemen, and also one of the time travelers is pregnant and has a kid called Adam. Great. Uh... I, I think I know where one of those concepts went. That probably would have been a worse film, especially with Arnie as the lead. I can't picture Arnie <laughs> like, in the Planet of the Apes I think movie. it would have been a different film, but not necessarily a worse film. <laughs> There's too many sexy apes! Ah! <laughs> but then uh, nothing from that really got off the ground. Uh, eventually, Chris Columbus was hi- uh, was hired to, to direct. Uh, he got the writer of Batman 89 to come in, actually, and he wrote a very odd script about an ape crashing into New York City in a spaceship and people from Area 51 having to investigate. Okay. <laughs> very weird. Uh, but then Chris Columbus was like, hey, Arnie, how about we ditch this project? Go and make Jingle All The Way. And so they went off and did that instead. <laughs> and the rest is history. Now, at the, this point, I think we're in the uh, mid-90s. Uh, Fox are desperate. They need a remake. So they approached heaps of directors. Uh, Rob and Zach, your job is to let me know, thumb up or thumb down, do you think this director could make a good Planet of the Apes movie? First person they approached was Roland Emmerich, director of Independence Day. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, that, I will do the opposite. That is a big thumbs down for me. <laughs> I just want Independence Day, but it's apes. That's all I want. <laughs> uh, they also approached James Cameron. Ooh, yes, that's right. Cameron yeah. was approached yeah. for a little bit. I got a sus. I got. I, I, yeah. Every time I try and get cynical about James Cameron, he pulls me back in. I'm a. I'm a bit. I'm a bit sus of CGI apes, but. I could give it a thumbs up. Yeah. You know. I'm sure he's capable of making a good Planet of the Apes. They approached Peter Jackson again. Ooh. But he did Lord of the Rings instead. I mean, I feel <laughs> like, yeah, he could have done something good, I think. I don't know. It's hard to say with Peter Jackson because he did do King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say The Hobbit, but also... Did he do The Hobbit, though? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's the problem, right? Did he do The Hobbit? <laughs> Or was he told how to do The Hobbit? Yeah. Uh, and finally, and finally, they finally approached Michael Bay. Hey. <laughs> we dodged a bullet there, didn't we, boys? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, he made Pearl Harbor. I don't know if that's a sentence I ever thought I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> that is something that I never thought I would hear before, but I'm very glad. And I agree with that statement. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank God Michael Bay made Pearl Harbor. What? <laughs> Context. You need, it's all in context. You got to get the get the context before you get. Yeah. Oh no, Michael Bay! No, <laughs> that would have been a Michael Bay Planet of the Apes oh. film. Sounds like a fever dream that someone had. It's, it's crazy <laughs> to think that that. Would even... Well, we probably would have gotten better action. Well, no, you would have. You you want you definitely would have got more sexy ape mm. action. There would have been a lot of low oh, no. low low camera angles of the apes working <laughs> on uh, on cars or motorbikes. Oh, oh. No, thank you. <laughs> Uh, but then, yeah, in 1999, the castaway writer wrote a script. Tim Burton was like, this is good. He got the guys that wrote The Undiscovered Country, the Star Trek film The Undiscovered Country, to come in and do rewrites. And that is how we got the film we're talking about today. Yeah, let's talk about Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. That's a much better film. Uh, that's, mm. a, that's a good movie. That's good stuff. No, let's talk about Mark Wahlberg as Captain Leo. Uh, he, before this, had done Three Kings, which is uh, pretty good. Three Kings is good. Three Kings is very good. Yeah. Ice Cube destroys a helicopter with um, a bomb on a football. It's, <laughs> it's very <laughs> silly. Um, he was also a rapper at this point, just putting that out there, and allegedly racist, uh, violently so. Anyway, Oof. Mark Wahlberg in this movie, he looks like he's a stand-in for Matt Damon. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he is, he is bad in this. He is so bad. He is horribly bad. He is, like, there is, it, like, they set him up, the, his character, as being this, you know, leader of the people and stuff like that. And he literally looks like a guy who's just, he looks like Brian from Life of Brian, who everyone <laughs> says he's the Messiah. And he goes, I'm not, I'm just, just a guy who just opened up my windows and I'm nude and everyone says I'm a Messiah. Yeah. So he's literally, 
the guy who falls into this position of greatness, and it's so fucking annoying. <laughs> yeah, I wish that he just doesn't seem to have a personality or something. No. He just kind of tells a, s- the story off the script. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird, because he's like, he's a soldier, but we don't see him really getting soldiery. I don't know. And th- that's the thing. There's no motivation for him other than getting home, which could be you know something that is used a lot. But when you're dealing with something that is as deep as this, like his connection with the apes at the start isn't even as strong as that of the the doctor who's looking after them. But but no, but you're wrong because he flies out to save the monkey. That's right. He <laughs> therefore does. he cares, and his right? acting range is either annoyed or pissed off, and that's all he yeah. can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe he would have done better with Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Bay and Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, but then they'd have to come up with some weird like Romeo and Juliet clause for the reason why he kisses oh, no, Estella Warren. Oh no, no, don't bring that. Yeah, don't bring that. Underage ape. Data. Oh yeah. no! <laughs> Why would you do that, Michael Bay? Why would you do that, Michael Bay? Why? The whole planet's a transformer. Michael Bay, stop it! Oh no! Just stop it! The whole planet's an ape. Oh no! The whole um. planet's an ape. <laughs> yeah, he's bad. He is so bad. He is. He is so uncharismatic in this film. There is nothing appealing about him whatsoever. He does an appalling job as our lead character. It's. 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 N- it was never going to work. Yeah. yeah. You're not a fan? <laughs> look, look, uh, look, I'm going to admit something right now. You may not have picked it up. <gasps> I don't like Mark Wahlberg as an actor. <sighs> I don't think, in fact, I don't think I have ever associated the word actor with Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, but Uncharted was right, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, he had more personality in Uncharted than he did this movie. I, I just, I got nothing from him. It was weird. I was trying to, like, pin what his character motive was, other than carry the plot. Yeah, um, there isn't any, really. Yeah, which is which is a shame, because I feel like you just give him some sort of character and emotions and stuff, he could have done something, but... I mean, even if it's like, I don't know, he kind of likes Helena Bomacato. He's just following her around. Mm. Like, even that would have been fine. But they don't even set that up properly. <laughs> no, they don't set up anything. There's so, so many threads just left hanging. And any opportunity to give him some sort of depth or, or connection or empathy is just... Yeah, it's, it's all sacrificed in the way of... Like, the original Planet of the Apes film is not a blockbuster. It's this wonderful sci-fi tale, yeah. a cautionary tale, and it, it takes its time. You know, you don't see the apes for like the first half an hour, uh, and it builds up. But within this, you know, within the first fifteen minutes, you're seeing apes in a really uninspiring way, and they sacrifice badly edited and put together fight sequences or action scenes. And I'm doing that in inverted commas. So they sacrifice the deep philosophical, political, religious type of undertones for, to make it a half assed blockbuster. Yeah, he's. it's really weird at the start because we mentioned that whole, like, scientist likes the apes more. Why wasn't he the guy that's like, hey, don't abuse the apes. They're like my little pilot bros, you know? Yeah, yeah. We're both pilots. We're both equals sort of thing, you know? Just a part of me was thinking, what if, what if the doctor, what if she went in to save the, the you know, to save Pericles yeah. instead of Mark Wahlberg. That would have been a much better film. Yeah, oh, well, I, w- I was about to say, and then Mark Wahlberg goes to save her, you know, that sort of thing, and that's how you get M- Mark Wahlberg out. Even just that would make more <laughs> sense. That would probably be fine, yeah. But yes, she would have made a better lead, for sure. <laughs> yeah, she was really good in the three minutes that she got on screen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, the rest of the cast is, yeah, like, Tim Roth, he's good, just off of the back of a bunch of Tarantino stuff. Uh, he's coming back in She-Hulk as Abomination, Ooh. which is more of him in lots of makeup. I, I don't know, there's some link there that someone could make. Um, <laughs> Helen Abomacato is Ari. she just come off Fight Club. Uh, this is her first collab with Burton. They got married later in 2001. Um, Estella Warren from Driven is in this. Driven, terrible movie. Terrible film. And she is terrible. She's good in Driven, but that's because that entire movie is garbage (laughs) (laughs) it's a low hurdle for her (laughs) she is really like there is no charisma with her in this as well and her connection with Wahlberg there's nothing it's a real 
Yeah, it's like, what? So our lead actor and our supposed lead sex symbol figure is that there's nothing. There is no chemistry between them at all. What do you mean? She stands there with wide eyes a lot. A lot. <laughs> she goes swimming in, in one part because she's a swimmer. She swims. Well, yeah. A lot. You're right. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> It's interesting, on uh, Wikipedia, it says down here at the bottom, like, it's got massive write-ups on Wahlberg, Burton, uh, Roth, Bonham Carter, even a little bit on Michael uh, Clark Duncan. But for Estelle Warren, it's just gone one line. A female slave, uh, she develops a romantic attraction to Leo. I'm going, was there? Was there a romantic attraction? In- I mean, they kissed at the end, and I went, where the hell did that come from? Well, here's my theory. My theory is... Uh, two versions of this, well, not two versions of the film were shot, but they made two love arcs, right? One with Ari, the chimpanzee, uh, that's a weird sentence, and one with Estella Warren. And they would, like, test out, you you know, one version of the movie has the arc with Ari all throughout it, you know, at the end you get the kiss, everyone's like, yay, you know, yes, you know, it, it all came together. The other one's the same thing, but with Estella Warren, um, except they, they forgot to cut out uh, the ending. And so the end of the film is Mark Wahlberg just kisses two people and then goes off. <laughs> and yeah, and Michael Clark Duncan's in this. He was the shaggy dog in Cats and Dogs, Zach. <laughs> He's the, the big gorilla g- guy. Ah. <laughs> Chris Christopherson, uh, Paul Giamatti, David Warner is in there for a bit. Linda Harrison returns. Uh, well, not returns. She's a different character, but she's from the first movie. And, of course, Charleston Heston is uh, Thade's dad, and he says the, the line. He says the line. He says it. Oh, uh, yeah. For no reason. <laughs> damn, damn them all. But Michael Clark Duncan says, like, the, he switches around. Like, within the first 20 minutes, he says, D- get your stinking hands off me, you damn dirty human yeah and you yeah. just go okay it's one of the most powerful lines in the whole original film and you just turned it into this throwaway line <laughs> Ugh, you can all burn in hell seriously <laughs> But for the reception, this has got 44% from the critics on Rotten Tomatoes, 27% from the audience, even lower. I'm actually surprised that audience is lower than critics, because critics really didn't like it at the time. Um, but turns out audiences hated it more. 5.7 out of 10 on IMDb. B- minus from Cinema Score as well, which is pretty low for them. Mm. Uh, a lot of reviews being like, this movie is so serious. Why? <laughs> um, also, everyone hates the ending. Even Tim Roth was like, it's a dumb ending. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something controversial again oh Oh, no the only good thing about the film for me is the ending ah i'm there going they should have made that they should have made a a a human crash land on an alternative earth where everyone is apes instead yeah i mean that would have been fun yeah yeah yeah, yeah. because what they did is kind of this completely new setup but the aesthetic is still very similar to the original film, but it's not the original pl- planet at all. Yeah. And so it, they should have just discarded that and just go, you know what? Let's do alternate reality type things and let just that opening five minutes crash lands on Earth and then yeah, yeah. apes are everywhere and you know find out where the humans are in the zoos and all that type of stuff. And this yeah. they're going, you know, how would that be? Because... In the original, like, only Taylor could speak because all the humans had devolved. But in this, all the humans spoke as well. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a thing I wrote down later on as that sort of revealed. Um, so what you're saying, Rob, is you would prefer it if they didn't make this film and instead made a different film. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I'm saying is, yes. <laughs> oh, and then it's Arnie and he has to do the running man, but it's all eight. <laughs> Exactly. That would have been a fun uh, movie. But he could he could like disguise himself as a gorilla or something because he's so massive. Uh, but yeah, th- this film did cost one hundred million dollars. How much money do you think it made, Zach, in the box office? That's a good question. I don't think it made too much money, but it did have the nostalgia factor. So I'm ooh, do I high? Do I low? I was originally thinking one fifty, but it may be two hundred. Two hundred dollars, not not mils. Okay. Um, <laughs> $250. Just Mark Wahlberg and his rap posse showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and they use that money to create Entourage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll go uh, 200 mil. That's what I That's what I guess. I think Rob already knows how much it's made, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's around about like 340 or 360. It is 360, yeah, 360. Yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> Thank you.
a mysterious invitation. An unknown host. Ten strangers trapped in a remote mountain lodge. I won't let anything get in the way of my having a good holiday. One dead. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Look at her. Nine remain. Finding the killer will be a process of elimination. Head to the Penny Peep Show podcast to listen to our latest series, A Process of Elimination. Do it now before you get eliminated. There were taglines. Here's two taglines, thumb up or thumb down. On July 27th, take back the planet. Down. (laughs) Not a fan? Not a fan? Thumbs down. Thumbs down. What does that mean? That has nothing to do with the movie I just watched. (laughs) Thumbs down. Yeah, exactly. You'll be sorry you were ever born human. Yeah, I am, after watching this movie. Yeah, well, they can't really say you'll be sorry you ever went and saw this film. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it thumbs up, because I agree. Because <laughs> that's, inter- that's the whole point of the first film. It doesn't depend on it, but it's the, the final nail in the coffin. Like Because it's in pop culture all the time, I knew the ending thanks to Spaceballs, <laughs> yep. before I had even seen the original. <laughs> mm, but yeah. it doesn't hinge on that. You, It's still an incredible film, and then it gets to that final moment, and it still gut a punch. It still gut punches you, even though you know it's coming. Um, and especially because, you know, he, he hates humanity, then he fights for humanity, then he's just so... Yeah, you know, yeah, he's brought up back to believing in humanity, only to be brought so low again. And you, so, so they went into this one going, well, we've got to have some sort of twisty, turny type of thing. And they're going, don't even try and do what the original did. Take this concept and go somewhere new. So go in a, a different type of twist or turn. Yeah. Which I, I can agree with. I think that's a good idea. You know, don't try and do the same thing twice. Yeah. And that's what the um, the recent trilogy did pretty well. They, you know, they went in a new-ish direction uh, and it worked really well for the most part. They still kept elements of it of the original uh, aspect of it. So sort of like, you know, humans and apes kind of going through this wilderness time before they fully evolve into the, the way they were thousands of years in the future. Um, mm. it, it's an interesting time thing, but I'm just thinking, just completely go off on a new tangent. Don't even try and connect it with this. Hence the parallel dimensions and go, let's see how weird you can go. Yeah. Which this movie at the start kind of could have done because uh, this film mm. does open in the year 2029 and we're on Deep Space Nine um, <laughs> in, in space. Yeah. Uh, Babylon 5, thank more, you. Ba- yeah, more oh. Babylon 5 than Deep Space Nine because there's no characters. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and we see uh, through the uh, through the giant screen in the command room uh, that there is an electromagnetic storm that they've uh, th- that they've been surveilling, and they're going to send a monkey into it. That's right, they're going to send because they still use monkey pilots. We see all the monkeys in cages as well. Mm. And it's a bit like ah uh, no. I was like, I was like, that. oh no, that they've got the monkeys in cages is very cruel. But that does come back as a sort of thing that they pointed out that they are in cages. So I guess it's a, it's a point. It, it was a bit weird when Mark Borberg was like, look at all these bored apes, and then like he showed his NFT <laughs> <laughs> to the screen. Boo! Because it's the future. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah, they all use NFTs. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it makes sense. <laughs> they send the chip into the uh, into the storm, and it gets oh te- teleported. What happens? Oh my! And Wahlberg's like, I've got to go find out. So he goes rogue. Because even though two seconds ago I was the one that was like, they're just apes. I don't care about them. Now I care about them. Mm, well, it's because he read the script. You know, that's ah uh, right. Yes, yes. He does that a lot during this movie yeah he does that a lot um and he flies off towards the storm and says the amazing line never send a monkey to do a man's job (laughs) 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 don't worry rob he has a lot of plot armor so there's no harm possibly happening to him (laughs) yeah anybody feel any tension at all during this movie that he was going to be injured whatsoever no there's a lot of tension in me going I hope he. Uh, I. I was. <laughs> I was hoping he'd get injured, and he didn't. So that's the. That's the really tragic, depressing ending of Planet of the Apes that uh, 
you know, Charlton Heston was depressed that humanity did prove that he shouldn't have had hope in them. And um, my tragedy was that at the end of this film, my hope of having Mark Wahlberg die in a horribly hideous <laughs> way on screen wasn't going to happen. No, he doesn't even get, like, slightly injured. He yeah. gets punched maybe twice. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the very movie, he could just get shot, you know, and that would have been it. There is that great moment, though, when Tim Roth, like, you know, trips him over, drags him to him, and, like, opens up his mouth with yeah. his fingers and looks into his mouth and goes, is there a soul in there? You go, oh, I'm sure Tim Roth asked for multiple takes of that. <laughs> sorry, 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 Tim, can I just do that one more time, please? I just need to... Uh, I didn't feel I was really in the moment. But come on, buddy, you, j- you nearly ripped off my jaw. I'm sorry, you Tim. You ripped just, off my jaw, man. My jaw! It's a peacock's jaw. You gotta let my jaw fly. <laughs> and then he, that's when he sweeps the leg and the jaw goes flying. Exactly. It's really poetic. I thought for a second, because like his pod gets transported somewhere, and then on uh, Babylon 5, they get a video message mm. from a person who looks like it looks like Wahlberg with old man makeup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's it's actually the old man in charge of Babylon 5. Him in even older makeup. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird that, because I thought that, like, it would be a time travel thing. Like, he sends them a message in the future on the planet. You know, he's, he's like an old man now or something. Yeah, but that would be far too clever. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, but it is, it is that old sci-fi trick of going, um, we need to do this and this. What are we going to do? Um, uh, the magic of space anomalies. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Ta- time traveling space anomaly. Woo. And they even, yeah, and they say that later on. Um. Mark Wahlberg's doing all the stuff, and he looks and goes, magic. And Mark Wahlberg says very unconvincingly, science. I'm going, you've never done anything scientific in your life, Mark Wahlberg. (laughs) You probably beat up a science kid at high school. I feel like every time Rob says something about about Mark Wahlberg, I need to put the word allegedly in front of it. (laughs) Just to make sure we're legally covered. (laughs) No, I'm pretty sure it's... It's uh, it's canon that he beat up nerds in high school, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think my statements are quite wild, but you can associate it. I'm glad that you have said allegedly a racist around <laughs> it. He allegedly has a face you want to punch. I don't think I know anyone who is a fan of Mark Wahlberg. Like, are they out there? I know people who like Jared Leto and don't like Mark Wahlberg. Like, <laughs> really? There are. They are. There are people, and there are people who like like his music as well. Oh, his music's all right. So just do that. Jared, you're not you're not Marlon Brando. You, Marlon Brando wasn't even Marlon Brando by the end. Okay, I like this movie that we watched that we're talking about. <laughs> I would have loved to see like a fifty. No, how old is Jared Leto? I think he's fifty. A fifty-year-old Marlon Brando make Morbius would be an incredible movie. <laughs> be, be better than what we got. And if he did it the same way, like he did Island of Doctor Moreau, so he just covered himself in white paint and had an earpiece <laughs> where someone had to feed his lines, that would be a hundred times better than anything Jared Leto has put on screen. Absolutely. But still have Matt Smith, obviously, because he's the best part of that movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. And, you know, Karen Gillan, you've got a lot to answer for, okay? Also, Matt Smith's agents, you've got a lot to answer for. Because I've got to do a comic <laughs> book film. Well, here's this Sony thing. Your agent should know better. As soon as you see the word Sony, kick them out. <laughs> yeah. Now they convinced him with the association with Marvel thing. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah, we're associated, yeah. all right? And Ri- and Richard Harris, oh, not Richard Harris, um... Anyway, we're talking about Morbius instead of Planet of the Apes. Fuck you, Planet of the Apes. Yeah. <laughs> when Morbius is more interesting than the movie we're watching now, it's really gone. I'm trying to think back. You've been very good to me. You've called me in on films that have been quite good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like a lot of a lot of excellent films. Mm. I think like the only dire ones, and Zach's going to hate me for this, <gasps> was uh, Flintstones. <gasps> I know. No. How dare you? And the the shittest one I saw, we didn't even get to review. So I, anytime I can mention about crackers, it's a pile of ass. <laughs> but you didn't get to talk about it because we couldn't make the scheduling work. I <laughs> know, right? You still watched it. <laughs> every, I still watched it. And every time I appear, I'm going to mention crackers. And so much so, I'm going to talk about crackers more than the actual film I'm meant to be brought on today, Planet of the Shithouse Apes. Speaking of. <laughs> Speaking of, yeah. Uh, what? He crashes into the planet. It. Yeah, he's teleported to some place into the future. He crashes into a jungle. He sees a bunch of humans are running away from some mysterious oh, creatures. Oh, it's oh, it's apes. Mm. It's apes, and they're all captured, and they're taken to the ape city, which looks 
great. I like the aesthetic. I love that um, far away shot we get to just set up the city. It looks quite jagged against, a, you know, against like an alien landscape. It's very nice. All the matte paintings and all the background work in this movie, fantastic. Yeah, costume design, production design is amazing. And it's interesting how the apes are presented because in the original film, they are fully evolved into a human-esque persona how they hold themselves whereas in this film obviously because it's a different world and a different evolution they're a lot more primal so they like they still climb trees they use their you know alternative you know limbs they use their other you know their fingers to play guitars or ride or they walk on all fours sometimes you know if they need to go fast yeah 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 that's how that's how they run you know and because that first attack scene in the original film is shot so beautifully outdoors and there's wide shots this uh replica of it is clearly done in a studio everything is so tight there's no mm. extensive scale or anything like that it's vicious as well they kill like there's shots of dead humans hung upside down mm. oh yeah uh, in the original but in this they're sort of like just put into cages oh what do you mean they talk about taking off a limb of a human at one point <laughs> I think that's pretty brutal, yeah. That's good enough to get you an M rating in Australia. <laughs> yeah, they talk so much. There's so much talking, and not even good talking. There's far more talking in the original, and it's good talk. It's great talk. It's interesting talk. This one's just all blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, oh, but, oh, oh, but... There's a lot of exposition. There is a lot of exposition, but there's also jokes. There's jokes like, all oh, the human rights faction, that they're throwing up a tantrum about these slaves we've got over here. <laughs> oh... <laughs> Pretty funny. It's funny because human rights, lol. Yeah. Am I right? Human rights. We don't even have that. <laughs> <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're seven years off this movie. Well, this is a fantasy movie, so we can kind of forgive it for having human rights. There's so many weird jokes in this movie, hey, Zach. The tone is odd. <laughs> it is. It is. Because it's it's super serious, but with jokes. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. It's weirdly serious. It's, you know, it's type of jokes it is. It's... Christopher Nolan jokes. <laughs> Christopher Nolan tries to do comedy and you just they're going, Oh no, don't don't try and be funny. <laughs> no, Dad, Dad, please, no, don't don't even try, Dad. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay, we get it. It's really awkward, Chris. Just we get it. You're very serious. Yeah, you're you're very hip with the kids, Dad, all right? <laughs> really cool. You could go watch the footy now. <laughs> Stop trying to do those Fortnite dances, okay? <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. Christopher Nolan's flossing. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's an image I didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> that's a cut scene from uh, Tenant. <laughs> from Tenant, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, he and Kenneth Branagh with whatever terrible accent he was doing in that film. <laughs> I, be I believe it was human. Yeah, but the, the jokes don't land and it's so clumsily put together at the start. Like they just, once they get to this planet, they just have a dinner party. And um, they're going, dinner parties were outdated in 2001. So. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, we were all about potlucks then. Dinner <laughs> parties? Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> there was a weird thing here with the whole, like, Matt Damon, like, tries to talk with the humans and they don't talk to him back. So I'm like, oh. They don't know how to speak. Okay, I'm cool with that, you know. Mm. But then later on, they just start talking. And I was like, wait, so they can speak? Like, because they talk about Matt Damon being different, right? But how? How is he different? He's not really that different in any way, shape or form. Oh, uh, to the other humans. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, because it's unlike the original where they've devolved on the planet Earth. Yes. This is, so this is a different variation where they are the descendants of this colony of people from Babylon 5 that crash lands. So therefore, they would still be able to speak because it hasn't devolved enough. Yeah, I wish, I wish they'd done more of like, a second class citizen sort of thing or like you know oh, the but humans... then they would have to deal with actual racism and then Mark Wahlberg would have to punch everyone <laughs> punch everybody ah <laughs> uh, that makes sense yeah that's why they couldn't because I, I think I would have liked that that angle more a bit more of like a instead of like maybe you could have one human that has like political power or something you know but yeah. everyone just constantly shits on him because he's a human you know that sort of thing that would have been a cool idea it's so weird because they went so close to the original but they went instead of them not being able to talk we'll dress them the exact same way 
but they can talk. Yeah, like what? <laughs> why? Why have? Why are they dressed like? What did they? Yeah. Why have they lost? Why? Why? Well, because they mentioned as well that there's like human habitats where they all live. Yeah, but they're all still dressed like cave people. <laughs> Yeah. Even though they, they live in towns, okay? Yeah, even though they're definitely, like, like, oh, it doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> exactly. It's it, it, it's that remnants of the original where they were savages and they didn't talk, and they were pests, but now they're here, but no, they talk and they kind of do have intelligence, but the apes don't see that, so that makes the yeah. apes seem dumber. Yeah. It doesn't actually make them savage. It makes them actually stupid. It should have been, like... The apes are bigger and stronger, and that's how they rule everything. And it's a right. ruling class system. But they have, like, they have a human in Parliament because they are intelligent. They are wise. They let him in. But, like, he doesn't actually have any political power. And he's and people constantly tell him, you're only here so we can say that we have humans in the Parliament. You know, that sort of thing. Mm. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be cool? Uh. So, Wahlberg and all the humans escape after the dinner party, and we get this... Very dumb scene where they keep running into like all the apes' bedchambers, yeah. and we see what the <laughs> apes do at night. We need to escape, and we need to do it as covertly as possible. You know how you be covert? Make sure you run so nobody sees you. Don't run in through every building imaginable. They run through every mm. building, and we see like this orangutan <laughs> getting a dance from his partner or whatever. We see this <laughs> one ape is like showering upside down with petals. <laughs> yeah. How how else would we have our our sexy dance monkey scene without them running through the bedrooms? You know. I actually remember watching this in the cinemas, and as I walked in, I went, I better get a sexy monkey dance. <laughs> I really do. It has to be interrupted by humans running through. Yeah, of course. But if I, if I don't get that, I'm going to be thoroughly disappointed. And then when it happened, I went, finally! That's what I've been waiting for in a Planet of the Apes film. <laughs> but now imagine if it was directed by Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> there was a there was a few interesting things. Like we had that scene where, of course, uh, they kicked over Mark Wahlberg. Um, hopefully, repeatedly. Yeah, during the dining scene. I like there was there's that one bit where they mention religion, and then it comes back way later on where like they go to eat and the the pig gorilla's like, no, we gotta pray. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> shut up. Oh yeah, because there's uh, the ape Jesus that's gonna come back. Yes, Simo. The ape Jesus. That's right. And that's important, but it's barely brought up until we get there. It's the MacGuffin, kind of. Yeah, it's it's uh, some sort of uh, deus ex, as it were. Oh, uh, yeah. I wanted to bring up, there's this little girl in the first 40 minutes of this movie who keeps getting pawned off. So at the start, she's given to one of the young apes as a pet, and then the humans break her out. And then they just give her to the good apes, and we never see her again. Yeah, no, I thought she was going to be a thing, but no. Not a thing. And there was no sort of like, you know, when she was taken, there's that potential to create that tension of a young being taken, but then no one responds and no one reacts. And you're there going, all right, so these, so these humans are placid and primal but then they start talking yeah Where, where's where's the mother going like no don't take my baby yeah you yeah. know that sort of thing the whole separation thing but uh nope they don't bother with that no too deep yeah too dark gotta keep this rating pg <laughs> uh they go to the site where mark Wahlberg crashed and they're like my ship's in this lake and Ari starts freaking out. Water! Ah! This is just established now! Ah! They're scared of water. It's not actually that they're scared of water. It's more that um they can't get the costumes wet. That's the <laughs> reason behind it. Ah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. <laughs> uh, the scene is so dumb because they, like, they come across the lake. They're standing there for, like, a minute. And then she looks up and sees the lake and is like, ah! <laughs> it's like a jump scare or something. Yeah, really like she is. gets spooked. If you hold up a picture of a lake, she's going, ah! It's it's very odd. And then like Mark Wahlberg goes to dive in, but he takes slightly too long to come back. So it's still a Warren being the swimmer that she is also dives in yeah. to grab him. C completely unnecessary sequence of events. Yeah, it could it, it could have been like a thing where he gets stuck and maybe there's a tiny bit of tension. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. But also, why can't the ape swim? 
I think that might be a thing. Yeah, but regular apes, sure. But, like, why couldn't intelligent ones learn to swim? It could have been cool if they, like, tied that into maybe um some sort of, like, religious thing. Like, you know, we can't go into the water because of this reason. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's, like, crashed spaceship in the water, so the, the, the elders forbid everyone from swimming yes. to yeah. stop them from finding the crashed spaceship or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y- you know what would have been really good to explain it? Mm. Anything! <laughs> Yeah, good point. <laughs> That's a good point. Just thought I'd uh, paraphrase <laughs> Bart Simpson there. This is why we get you on the show for these hot <laughs> takes. Yeah. yeah, Rob Lloyd and his insightful comments on script writing. <laughs> Literally goddamn anything. Anything. Just do anything, for fuck's sake. Do anything. <laughs> So he got a thing, uh, it's like a motion tracker thing uh, to track where his team's at, because he's like, oh, it's showing that my ship, the um, a Babylon 5, uh, <laughs> the, the, the crew are here on the planet. And I'm like, mm. okay, because he specifically says this tracks the ship and not this tracks the crew. Yeah. And as soon as he's like, the ship's somewhere on the planet. I'm like, it's a space station. It crashed. It's obvious. Yeah. You can sort of forgive it because it's like a tracker or whatever. It's also like uh, some sort of multi tool device. I don't know. But like, he would suspect that they would come after him, right? Mm. So he he's like, oh, there's my, there's my friends. Got to meet up with them. Got to fly back to the space station, you know. But yes, it is, it is dumb. It's very silly. And then uh, Paul... Giamatti, as the slave master that gets redeemed, uh, comes in. <laughs> uh, Warburg has a gun and fires at him, and Ari's like, "Guns? Those are those are primitive and dangerous." And they destroy it. Uh, yeah, because it would be too plot convenient <laughs> if they had a gun, so we have to get rid of it somehow. Exactly. Paul Giamatti in this movie, he's funny. He's very funny. But he's playing a slave master that this movie redeems. <laughs> but he doesn't. Yeah. Does he really get? He doesn't really get redeemed. Like, because at the end, he's like, he's still stealing stuff that they kind of just accept it. Going, oh, you're, he's like the lovable racist uncle mm. that everyone yeah. tolerates. And I use the word lovable in inverted commas because that's again they tolerate him as opposed to him actually fully redeeming himself. Yeah, no, the movie tells you that he's redeemed, but he hasn't earned it in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> yeah, yeah no. exactly. No, it's uh, it's like an American horror story <laughs> redemption where they feel the need to redeem every problematic character, but not actually. <laughs> the show just tells you that they're redeemed. It was really weird. I was going to mention it because at the end he's like, "Hey, kids, who wants to buy some aspirin?" And all the kids come running, "Yay!" And I'm like. One, they have been at war forever. The kids would have been terrified of the fucking apes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because they just come in and murder people. Two, this character's all aboard suddenly working with the humans, even though his entire life has been slave trading. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, races. Ah, oh, it's just dumb. It's very silly. It's very silly. But Paul Giamatti is good in this, so I guess I'll be Yeah, yeah, it is funny. He's great. His physicality is amazing. The way his voice is great. He and Helen Bonham Carter and um, Tim Roth, they have a great chemistry together, the mm. three of them. So it, yeah. He's a great sleazeball. And, he, and, uh, and it proves that um, in evolution, there will always evolve a <laughs> sniveling rat person in every <laughs> exactly. society. Exactly. It is a need. <laughs> so then we cut to Fade. He's got full military power from the senator now or something. He's just gone Palpatine on, yeah. on this uh, group of apes. We never get to see, like, the Senate or any thing. They, like, talk about it a lot, but we don't actually see it. No. Which I guess... Uh, that's what people say is to always talk and don't show in your movies, so... I wonder if they would have hid E.T. in the Senate like they did in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been cool. That would have been funny. Or Misha, <laughs> an ape! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Allegedly. (laughs) Allegedly. Allegedly. (laughs) But then he goes to visit Charlton Heston as his dad, Zach. Well, what happens here? Uh, One of the greatest scenes in cinema history. Oh, wait, I'm thinking of (laughs) nothing else. He has this whole thing where he talks to his son and is like, 
I've passed on this thing from my grandfather, my grandfather before. I'm like, how how did they pass this on? This is like thousands of years that managed to keep this secret. Also, he's a direct descendant of Seema. And it's a lot of exposition. Yes. He goes and smashes a pot. My only question is, do they keep having to remake the, the <laughs> pot thing every time they tell their son? <laughs> they have to make a new pot for them to smash dramatically <laughs> to discover the gun. Also, he doesn't. That gun doesn't come back. <laughs> never comes also, back. they 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 use the whole uh, damn the ball. Uh, look, there's a lot happening in this scene. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, okay. Look, yeah, Charlton Heston only did two movies. He was the lead in the first one. He came back for just one day of shooting for the mm. Beneath the Planet of the Apes. He got mm. paid a bucket load of money and he only wanted to come back for one or two days. And so they had him for a short amount of time. He comes in, does a little bit right at the end, gets shot, and they blow up the entire world. Sorry, spoilers. Um, but the real hero of the Planet of the Apes films and became the lead from the third one onwards was Roddy McDowell. And so I always, and a lot of fans, associate Planet of the Apes not with Charlton Heston, but with Roddy McDowell. Yeah. Roddy McDowell became the face and the voice of it. He even did the TV show, the short-lived TV show that was cancelled, oh, yeah. which is still pretty good. I, I recommend that one. That's a good mm. sort of like variation where humans are more trying to coexist as opposed to completely alien, um, completely primal. But um, yeah, so I'm there going, I don't want Charlton Heston in this film. <laughs> I, you know, but poor old, poor old Roddy had passed away by, by that stage. He passed away in the 90s. Um, okay. But there's an interesting thing about uh, Tim Roth was very uncomfortable shooting scenes with Charlton Heston because Charlton Heston was so, you know, was president of the National Rifle Association and all that type of stuff. And Tim Roth was very against that type of stuff. So he said, I, it was very hard for me to shoot these scenes because I had to pretend like he's my father and all this type of stuff when I oppose in every fiber of my being everything that this man stands for. Yeah. Mm. And, he, and he's come out and said... You know, I didn't want to talk to him on the set or anything like that. And he said, if if I knew beforehand that I would be in this film with Charlton Heston, I wouldn't have accepted it. So Interesting. Okay. Um, which I find really fascinating. And I have even more respect for Tim Roth now. Than, yeah, I was yeah. about to say kudos for him for going through with it. Because, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's one of those actors who like talks a lot about how he actually felt making movies afterwards you know like it's great like he's not all you know he's not um just lying to the media or something or just saying like the bland copycat things yeah he's all like oh it was great everyone got along everyone's best friends you don't know it's like hey this guy's i don't like him <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's one of those actors where you can go oh he's doing an interview everyone let's pay attention yeah. So that scene's completely pointless. Um, <laughs> the overall, uh, well, it's a lot of exposition for the viewer because oh, it's yeah, like, oh, right. hey, we're explaining the thing that I mean, we're going to explain it later on anyway because we're going to go to the spaceship and it's going to be this big reveal, even though we've just explained it now. Apparently, it's a lot of exposition. Yeah. Um, I just wondered about that pot. It's like, do they make the pot every time for this dramatic <laughs> effect? Or is he, like, the last one that gets the gun? Why doesn't the gun come back? He's given a gun. Why? What? Yeah, it's silly. The, his di dying dad's last wish is to give him this gun, which has a power of a thousand spears or whatever, and it, he doesn't do anything with it. Literally, the plot just forgets they gave the monkey a gun. Oh, sorry, ape. He sniffs it. Yeah, he does sniff it. Allegedly. 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 Oh, Allegedly sorry. Tim Roth sniffs a gun. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, oh, they've got a, we go back to Wahlberg. I'm trying to come up with a fun name for the crew, but I can't. Wahlberg and the apes. Um, <laughs> Marky Mark and the apes are <laughs> walking across the planet. They, uh, may maybe it's uh, Marky Mark and uh, the monkey bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Uh, yeah, they bring back the scare humans, uh, you know, the scarecrows, but for humans, they bring those back, mm, uh, yeah. and they look more tamer than they do in the original. Mm. Definitely. It's odd, but they find out that, yeah, Wahlberg's tracker is leading them to Kalida, which is uh, a holy site where the first ever ape or something came out or something. It's the Garden of Eden. Yeah, it's the Garden of Eden. It's where, uh, the ape Jesus will come back. Yeah. 
Uh, but first, they've got to cross a giant camp of apes. And Rob, this scene is weird because we see this camp and it looks like it's outside. You know, we kind of go through the camp. We see, you know, the apes are gambling, etc. Um, and it looks quite outside. You know, the lighting is pretty spot on. But whenever we get shot to the sky, it's a matte painting. <laughs> yep. Again, these guys are the worst people at escaping ever. Like, they go through every single building of a city to escape, as opposed to going, I don't know, a back alley or through, you know anywhere that's hidden and here they go oh okay well we need to get to the water cool well we'll go around this way go around that way and mark Wahlberg goes no it's too much takes too much time and they all just go oh okay i'm going no 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 that's the smarter option is to go around and take as long as you need to get away so you're not spotted they go no we're just going to get on horses and ride our way through it <laughs> right you're going it. it's stupid stupid these people are stupid people and even the, the intelligent apes are even more stupid because they let them get away. <laughs> they do. Yes. It, it, it could have been like a whole, like, these guards are super lazy because they're guarding this water or whatever, you know, they're an outpost or whatever, but, like, they never get any confrontation, so they're super lazy and stuff. But the movie goes, oh, here's the Grand General. He's coming in to ship shape them all up, right? <laughs> yeah. So you can't even make that excuse. Because they've got the super general dude in. You know, it's always it's always a odd choice from a script writer to go, you know what? We'll make the audience do all the heavy lifting and, <laughs> you know, do make all those narrative plot leaps themselves. I mean it's all up for interpretation, Rob. Yeah. It's actually a really deep move. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it, it is. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This is such a good movie. Allegedly. Yeah, uh, allegedly this is art house and up for interpretation. <laughs> you can lead a script writer to a, a, a paper, but you can't make him write a good script. Oh. Exactly. You can lead a script writer to Planet of the Apes to water, but they can't go in because they're scared of drowning. <laughs> yes. Scared of- Correct. Yeah. Uh, but Zach, they come across Kalita. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they manage to escape um, the slaver... A, a, a dude is like, hey, they attacked me, so I guess I'm with you now. Oh, yeah. All the apes had, like, ample chances to escape, but they're like, nope, we're, we're with you now. His exact line of dialogue is, don't put those handcuffs on me. They attacked me too, so I guess we're allies. That's not how it works. Yeah. That is not how it works. So, yeah, they, they come across this, this ancient temple, Uh, Which looks very suspiciously like the broken shell of the space station we saw earlier. Mm. And oh my god, it is. Oh, it's not Babylon 5 anymore. Now it's Babylon Fried. (laughs) 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 You've been waiting an hour and 20 minutes for that one. They set up the they set up the scarecrows to that were used in the original to keep you know, to keep people away to keep you know the the apes or the humans away to keep everything away from what's hidden within the forbidden zone like in the original okay and it works but in this film they show the scarecrows and within five minutes of them making it to this holy ground all the humans just rock up <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah all the humans are going oh yeah they've just come here that is the stupidest mother effing thing in this whole film. It makes no sense whatsoever. They're just there. Like, so this thing that was meant to keep people out for thousands of years, no, nah, they just go, oh, Mark Wahlberg's. Oh, there's a chance to see Mark Wahlberg do a concert. Yeah, we'll go along and see that. Yeah, what the fuck is happening? Why are they here? What? It doesn't make any sense. How did they learn about Mark Wahlberg? Yeah, but that's Why it. did they care enough to leave? The writing was something like Mark Wahlberg has given the humans hope that they can how uprise, but how? Why? Well, because you see, as he was running through every building in every house in every street, he was running along, and so every single human being saw him, mm. and ah. they went, "Oh, there's oh, that's Marky Mark. Oh, and, and he's and he's Monkey Bunch. Oh, <laughs> well, wherever they're going, they must be doing a good concert. Yeah." He had one song hit the hot fifties in Germany. <laughs> yeah, I, I miss I miss the scene where once they're all together, Marky just starts rapping <laughs> and everyone starts cheering. Yeah, yeah. And all the monkeys go, It's such a good vibration. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a sweet sensation. Yeah. 
Anyway, Kalina, uh, they got the name from a sign that dust was covering and no one bothered to wipe off. So they were like, oh, those letters are Kalina. Mm. Then uh, then it sort of revealed what, what exactly happened as Mark is like, oh, shit, everyone's fucking dead, yo. <laughs> yeah. Well, they dropped their one F-bomb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my character is deeply moved. You can tell by the emotion on my face. Um, and then he plugs in his device and gets everything working. We see some recordings and we get that like distress call that they made that we saw early on in the film. And then, and then you see the, uh, the, the doctor and you see the older version of the doctor just Mm. before she gets killed by the highly intelligent apes. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't really explain how the apes got super intelligent and started fighting back. The atmosphere. Yeah. The atmosphere. The atmosphere unlocked uh, new things in their What well, was the atmosphere minds. combined with the weird space anomaly, which gave them time brain powers, obviously. Ah, space magic. And that's how the Time Lords got started. That's right, this is actually written by Chris Chibnall. <laughs> that is sure written by Chris Chibnall. And and all the and all the apes are from a parallel dimension in there and they can just regenerate every single time until yeah they're immortal monkeys this planet is actually krypton whoa this sounds so much better than the film we've actually watched (laughs) and better than season 13 of doctor who (laughs) well mind you me sleeping on the couch is better than season 13 of of doctor who me stubbing my toe early in the morning (laughs) something something allegedly allegedly Fades legions, they rock on up. They're like, I hope you're ready for a fight, humans. It's fight time. And Mark Wahlberg is like, let's leave. And they're all like, no. And no. I'm like, what? Just fucking leave. Why? And, and the stupid kid goes, I want to go out. Said, no, you're young. Stay here. I'm going to ride out anyway. And as soon as I ride out, my horse oh, falls over. Yeah. And then Mark Wahlberg can run all the way to him. Uh, all the way to him to like pat the horse. And the pat's like, the horse is like, oh, I can get up now. <laughs> I can get up now? Oh, okay. I was just waiting for Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so dumb it's an annoying action scene and the apes run so long i'm saying just get on a horse and ride that way don't run all that way you idiots and also like mark Warburg explains his plan in the vaguest way possible it's actually quite comedic he's like so what we're gonna do is you're gonna be here and then i'm gonna go there all right now i'm gonna talk to these people what we're gonna do is gonna be hard but we're gonna do it it's just like yeah. Parody. They really needed someone to stop and just go, Paul Giamatti should go, no, seriously, you haven't actually explained what the fuck's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Could you tell us all what we're doing here? Because Mark Wahlberg's plan is that uh, he's got to bait the monkeys in, and then there's leftover fuel in the ship, in the space station. So he's going to use that to blast them. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. He's going to wait till, you know, the big bad guy comes in and then boom, he's going to blast him. They're going to do this whole thing where they jump out of the... No, they send him the first wave of, like, the smallest unit and he blasts them. Very dramatic. But now he's fucked because the monkeys have so much more numbers than him and he just used his big weapon on (laughs) fucking nothing so they just lose. Mind you... While while the the ship was like warming up to fire off all that big explosion and vent, the ship started shaking, and you know what that created? Good vibration. <laughs> <laughs> it's Boo. such a sweet sensation. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, it caused good vibrations. Allegedly, and this was the last episode. Rob Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> That was pretty funny, though, when we see, like, yeah. tons and tons of what I can only assume are, like, dummy apes just flying. Yeah, it <laughs> was just, pretty great. They just go flying. And they're from different angles as well, so you just constantly saw that they just kept on falling out of the sky. Here's what you do in that scene. You have the first wave come in, and the humans fight it out. And it's like, oh, the apes are winning. And so uh, Thane goes like, well, I don't want to be left out of uh, victory, you know. And the general goes, no, wait, this might be a bait or something. And he's like, nah, fuck you. I want to get in there. He charges. Then all the humans run away. Boom, we explode him. We win the battle. Something, something. I don't know. But then all the apes get up and it's like, oh, shit, we're still going to lose or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. We man. tried our best. And then you can have your stupid deus ex machina bullshit. I was just, I was so mad that it was such a dumb plan that they hyped up with vague bullshit. It was, uh, uh, yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. 
But then down from the oh, there's a Wilhelm scream. <clears throat> there is a Wilhelm scream. But anyway, uh, down from the skies comes Space Jesus. <laughs> In a pod. Yeah. It's the ape Jesus. And the ape Jesus is like, I can't talk because I'm the ape from the start of the movie. Yeah. I took forever to come down because time travel, I guess. But also, I like, it was kind of funny how he landed the pod perfectly, unlike Matt Damon. Um, but that's a small bit because the next scene is, is Thane beating the shit out of Mark Wahlberg. That was satisfying. It was. It was. And but then beats the shit out of Pericles, which was not satisfying. No, don't beat that thing. But here's the thing, right? So later on, we have this whole thing where the gorilla turns on Thane for no fucking reason whatsoever, and it's infuriating. Why wasn't the gorilla like coming in to check on Thane, and then he sees Thane attack Suma and is like, "Hey, maybe Thane's not such a good guy," or something? Oh uh, yeah, because the gorilla's the religious gorilla. Yeah, because he's super religious, right? That's his whole fucking thing throughout the whole thing is he's super religious. So then he sees the sacrilegious act and that's why he flips, you know, that's why he's like, no, that's, ah. Yeah, it's so stupid. He's there, he's there going, wait a minute, this character who's been super violent and super aggressive the entire film is super violent and super aggressive to (laughs) our religious figure. I didn't see this coming at all. I've had a change of heart. Yeah. Yeah. So weird. That could that could have been a thing, but but the, they don't know how to write a story apparently. So nah. I guess f- fuck. It's just annoying because it's like you, all you needed to do was put the gorilla there to witness it. Yeah. And that that would have that whole scene next scene afterward would make sense, but of course it doesn't happen. <sighs> it's very silly. It's, Allegedly. It, it, it's. <laughs> It's so dumb. And also, like, the way that Fade is quote-unquote defeated until we get the um the very end of the, the movie is he's locked behind a blast door that's yeah. bulletproof and he keeps firing the gun, but it ricochets, so he hides under the table. Yeah, yeah. He tries to, like, say, hey, gorilla, go get him. And the gorilla's like, no, you lied about everything. And it's like, what? what? Why do you think Thane lied about anything? The gorilla has no reason to think that Thane has lied to him. Oh, uh, it's because um, it's because uh, Wahlberg is friends with Ape Jesus, and so right Thane or whatever his name is, uh, being uh, being against humans is is bad. Actually, <laughs> I think that's what they're trying to do. Is it? But we don't see that. I don't know. It's so dumb. I just don't know why this gorilla just just turns side for no fucking reason. And it's infuriating to me. And also, like, why this is the end? Because the army is now fine because they saw the ape Jesus. Yeah, they saw Sumo, so they're all... Uh, they saw ape Jesus, so they're all calm. And, and like, so, so the gorilla's like, oh, we'll bury all the bodies together so they can all be respected equally. And I'm like, well, why are you so pro-human now for no fucking reason? <laughs> yeah. And like all the other apes are super pro-human. Like the slaver one's like, oh, hey, children, I'm here to sell you drugs. Yeah. Um, I mean, even from the story of Jesus, right? What happened is he came down and was like, all oh, this stuff and this thing and this thing. And then the people that believed in the thing that was before then, they killed him, right? That's the story. Yeah. That, yeah. So why didn't that happen? Yeah. Why was it this big split? That, that should have been the thing that saved them is, like, the monkeys get divided into the people who are like, no, we got a sumo's here, we need to serve him now. And the other group is like, no, this is all blasphemy, whatever, you know, this isn't the real sumo. Yeah, that would have been, I guess, interesting. Then they have to fight amongst each other, and that's how the humans win, is because they're fighting amongst each other. Something, something. Oh, I could write a better script in my fucking sleep. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> And then Mark Wahlberg's like, oh, I found the magic time travel storm. I'm going to go there. But Ari's like, no, stay and marry me or something. And he's like, you're an ape. <laughs> Lol, no. <laughs> and then Estelle Warren goes, no, stay with me. We can watch Drive. It'll be awesome. Wahlberg kisses them both, which is odd. <laughs> That's an odd way to end your movie. So silly. But anyway, it's all over now because Wahlberg heads off into the storm. Oh, thank God. I'm glad we don't have to deal with any more apes for the rest of this movie. He somehow magically travels back in time. Like, he knows the right place to enter the storm to go back in time or something. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, we'll see. What he does is, like, the first time, except instead of winding the clocks forward, he winds them backwards. Oh, was he manually winding the clock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That was totally what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was actually setting it in. 
Not the first time. That's when the electronics wigged out. The second time he was like typing in the year, right? Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. But anyway, he lands in Washington, D.C., and the Abraham Lincoln statue is is General Fade. Is an Abraham Lincoln statue. <laughs> uh-huh. Now, Rob, you saw this one in the theatres, right? You, I did. You saw this. What, what, what was the crowd's reaction? It was all very much a, um, you fucking what? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the only one that went, now that would have been interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. That last five minutes. Do that for two hours. I would have watched. Oh, what? It's over now? You motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the movie started to get interesting. Roll credits. Oh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and as soon as it happened, I went, yeah, this is not going to be going down well at all. No one's going to be happy about this. Yeah. Thane lived. Thane, Thane, Thane killed everyone. Thane, Thane won in the end. But Mark Wahlberg won. Yeah, like, when did he travel back in time to become... Did he go... What What happened? <laughs> <laughs> How long do apes live for? I- I'm not super f- familiar with the order of American presidents, but, like, Lincoln's not the first. No, mm. Lincoln was during the Civil War. Yeah, so did he arrive during the Civil War and got some sort of, uh thing to inject into all the, the the monkeys and then he made an army and then took over yeah i think during the civil war <laughs> well no i i no this is this is definitely the same planet he just left right or or maybe it's earth i don't know anyway like uh, my theory is thane escapes and he takes mark Wahlberg's old ship and he tries to follow him but he fucks it up and so he comes you know 200 years earlier right look it's um the answer is space magic. Oh, oh. No, that's fine. But there's a Tim Roth was interviewed about it and said, "I can't explain that ending. I have seen it twice and I don't understand anything." <laughs> <laughs> um, but then uh, Tim Burton was uh, he explained it by going, "It wasn't supposed to make any sense. It was more of a cliffhanger to explain a possible sequel." And uh, Burton said. It was a reasonable cliffhanger that could be used in case Fox or another filmmaker wanted to do another movie. Mm. So he literally set it up in a way to go, let's go as ambitious and weird and nonsensical as possible. And so if it goes well and people want to see that explained, we'll explain it in the second one. And I think it pretty much proved everyone went... No. No, we don't want to see it explained. (laughs) Well, at least 20th Century Fox did. Yeah, the audiences kind of go, well, now you've done it, now you've got to explain it. That's pretty interesting that, yeah, it's one of those classic, we will end this series with a cliffhanger, but we don't know how we're going to resolve it. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty classic um, disaster is is usually how those go. (laughs) Exactly. But anyway, that's Planet of the Apes. Rob, is this an oldie? Is this a goodie? I don't think it's worse than an oldie. I mean, it's pretty bad. (laughs) What is worse than an oldie? Well, we don't. We haven't really done that this year. We've got the Nightmare in the Butt Award, uh, which we <laughs> gave to Monkey Bone. I don't know why. I don't remember why. It's because ninety percent of the that movie is fart jokes. So look, okay. So because of the you know, the brilliance of uh, Danny Elfman's music, the brilliance of Rick Baker's makeup, the brilliance of Gem- Giamatti, Bonham Carter, and. Um, uh, Tim Roth, I'll I will just give it an oldie. It doesn't deserve to die in my butt or whatever you call it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. Allegedly, <laughs> yeah. Look, I I think that the main problem with this movie is there's a lot of missed potential here. There's a lot of good stuff that could have been good, but um, it just sort of falls short in a lot of places. Uh, mostly that story ending there. What the... Mm, why are there people here? Why Why is the gorilla turn? I don't know. Why, why are these people talking but dressed like they're, you know, savages? Yeah, I reckon you're right. I think I'm just going to give this a goodie as well. Uh, just an oldie. A goodie? Uh, oh, 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 my God. Oh, wow, Allegedly a goodie, it. and by that I mean no, it's an oldie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I will also give it an oldie. I'm, I'm disappointed because I actually, I was I was pretty on board for a lot of it. Oh, the visuals are cool. Okay, we've got the sort of like, so to say, it was like moments of it was like, wait, is, is this movie fucking terrible? <laughs> um, like when the humans weren't speaking, I was like, okay, all right, we've got no talking humans again. Okay, I'm cool with that. And then the humans just started talking. I'm like, huh? Wait, what? And then, yeah, it just keeps doing that sort of thing when nothing makes any fucking sense. Yeah, yeah. I guess if you haven't seen the original and you watch this 
on like a surface level. I don't know. It's on in the background. You might be tricked into thinking that it's like it's, <laughs> it's good. It's visually quite nice. So you know. yeah, it sneaks up behind you and goes, oh, "I'm good." <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. Welcome to 100 Horrors, a comedy podcast that seeks to rank the best 100 horror films of all time, as dictated to us by a poster that one of us owns. Every week we bicker over another film in an attempt to give it an overall scare factor and secure its place in the 100 Horrors list. With features such as... But at least I won't die like that. And... What would you say to them at the funeral? We take a light-hearted approach to horror cinema so that it can be enjoyed by even the most squeamish of listeners. So whether you're the person who's never seen a horror film in their life or the person who has a tattoo of Leatherface on the right arse cheek, there's something to be enjoyed in every episode of 100 Horrors! <laughs> Now, they, of course, never made a sequel to this, but uh, that did lead to the fantastic reboot trilogy that we did get. I really like them. Um, I haven't seen them as a trilogy in a while, but I'm actually interested in going back to them. Maybe on Patreon we could do the classics and the trilogy. I don't know. Ooh, that'd be cool. Yeah, but we never got an actual sequel to this film, and that's what we're going to do right now. But it's not just going to be a sequel. It's going to be a crossover with something else we've reviewed on the podcast. Random Number Generator is going to give me an episode number. Uh, episode 129... I'm going to come up with a crossover between this film and the film we reviewed on that episode, which was The Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, have you seen The Brave Little Toaster? <laughs> I have not. Give me a quick synopsis. It's Toy Story, but they're, they're household appliances. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, but also it's very dark in places. Like, the appliances die. <laughs> There's a whole song about cars wanting to be euthanized. It's crazy. Yeah. It's a really weird kids film from the 80s. It's great. I loved it. (laughs) Um, So, in the future with Abraham Lincoln... Well, we've already got space magic, right? Yeah, space magic. So space magic can explain why all these appliances are now sentient. And why the monkeys are sentient. Oh my god, it all comes back. It's space magic is making everything sentient. All right, okay, so uh, the sequel opens, uh, Mark Wahlberg is captured and um, uh, taken into uh, a compound prison. Uh, He keeps quiet because he's learnt from his lesson that, you know, you don't talk. So Leo is uh, keeping quiet. Doctor comes in, an ape doctor comes in to examine him, all that type of stuff, Uh, finds out that he could talk. And this creates waves across this this new earth of apes that the human can talk, the human can talk. And this inspires all the household appliances who have been silent for generations because <laughs> they can talk too. And so they work together and plan a way of breaking out Mark Wahlberg <laughs> and, and Leo. And so then it is the apes versus Mark Wahlberg and the home appliances to see... Who will actually claim the planet of the apes and toasters? I think I, I'd like to have like a rogue faction of the household appliances because there's the household appliances that want to keep going on with the secrecy, like Toy Story, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there's this rogue group that's like, no, we can't be oppressed anymore. We've got to break out. Let's get this Mark Wahlberg guy and we're going to fight off these apes so we can be the dominant <laughs> species. And then Mark Wahlberg has to choose between the ruling class whether he chooses apes or random kitchen appliances and at the end he has to try and get back to earth and before he goes he kisses the scientist ape and then he kisses um uh, you know uh, uh, an electric saw yes <laughs> so, yeah. yes the electric saw who's <laughs> voiced by uh, no. helen hunt <laughs> Helen Hunt, great, excellent. I was gonna, I was gonna say Julianne Moore. Uh, Julianne Moore would also mm, be good. Yeah, mm. yeah. Helen Hunt's the TV version of uh, Julianne Moore, and it's called Return to the Planet of the Apes and the Kitchen Appliances. And then the sequel is, uh, or, or it's the Brave Little Planet. Ah, the Brave Little Planet. Return to the Brave Little Planet of the Apes. <laughs> that sounds absolutely horrific. <laughs> the question is: Is this an animated film? 
Or is it like half animated? Maybe it's like a Roger Rabbit. Yeah, like a Roger Rabbit situation. Yeah, that's exactly it. Get Rick Baker back and get the team who did the Roger Rabbit animation to yeah. to bring the toasters to life. I reckon that would be pretty good. <laughs> Zach, let's do some reviews. All right, it's time for everybody's favorite segment. It's time for Rotten Review. Allegedly our favorite segment. <laughs> yeah, allegedly. Uh, it's the part of the show where I go to the best place for reviews, Rotten Tomatoes, and go for the best people who are clearly correct in this situation because they rated this movie lower, the audience. And I get their unbiased opinions which you guys have to guess the score of. The score goes from uh, 0.5 to 5. And uh, I've hidden my little review in here somewhere as well. One of these reviews is not like the others, because I made <laughs> it. <laughs> Your first review is from Maja, who says, Predictable, oh no, oh no, oh please no. Ending. <laughs> what? Oh, that's uh, one and a half. One and a half. Mm. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go zero point five because this has a super negative score. I think. Well, in these uh, bonus battles, we're doing closest first, right? Yeah. We yeah, always explain wins. this bit now. Yes. Because it's relevant. Yes. Uh, because it's actually three out of five. Wow. Three out of five. They gave this quite positive, in fact. But because Rob is closest, he gets the point. Gets that point. Good work. We have Etu who says. The plot is just stupid. Outright absurd at times. The laughable ending was the shiny red cherry atop of this abomination of a movie. Wow. Uh, abomination? Tim Roth. Hey. Yeah. yeah. It all comes back. If he, You don't use the word abomination lightly, so I'll go one out of five. I'll go uh, 0.5 out of five. Mm, uh, good choice. But it is one out of five. Oh. It is one out of five. One out of five. So Sa- Sandro gets a point. We have uh, Gabriel, who says, Matty has the most powerful plot armor I've ever seen. Matty? Yep. <laughs> who calls Mark Wahlberg Matty? I love that. That's really go- uh, good on this person. Um, I'll give it uh, two, out of, two out of five. I'll go 2.5. Uh, it's 2.5. Hey. It's 2.5. There we go. Sandro's getting ahead. Uh, maybe Rob can agree with Just, who says, Not terrible, but very Tim Burton. Um, three. It isn't even that Tim, like, it doesn't feel like, like, if you told me that Tim Burton directed this, I definitely wouldn't believe you. Um, I would say this is, uh, probably a two. Uh, well, it's 2.5. Oh. So I guess you both get a point. Both get a point on that one. All right. All right. Yep. 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 Uh, we have Nicholas who says, AKA Tim Burton sells his soul to Hollywood. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. Yeah. That's got to be a one, surely. I'll go 1.5. Ah, it's 1.5. So Rob gets the point. So it's all tying it up. We've only got a couple more to go. We have Muhammad, who says, it's a good movie to watch. (laughs) I feel like every movie has, like, five reviews. that are just, it's a good movie. Yeah, I know. Well, like, what a review. What a powerful review. It's a movie which you can watch. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Put put that on the poster. Wow. Uh, uh... (laughs) Oh, (laughs) <laughs> I'd know three because it's right down the middle. I'll give it 2.5. Well, you're closest because it's two out of five. Oh, oh, apparently wow. it's not that a good movie to watch, apparently. Uh, so Rob getting ahead. And we have finally my favorite review by uh, Sarah, who says, I was going to give it five stars, but no sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Planet of the Apes has ever done a bestiality sequel. <laughs> no, no, it hasn't. I, I guess it's probably four then. I'll give it 3.5. Ah, it's four out of five. Hey. Hey. That means that it's a tie because we're on four points each. I'm going to guess your one, Zach, is Tim Burton sells his soul to hold. I think that's your one. Um, I think your one is uh, it's a movie you can watch. <laughs> <laughs> you think that I made that review? I am offended. I'm just going to spoil it. I didn't make that fucking review. That's a terrible review. <laughs> I hated that. <laughs> but it's, it is very you. <laughs> I made the Gabriel one. Matty has the most powerful plot armor I've ever seen. I call him Matty. Because you always get him mixed up with Matt Damon. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's the episode right there, Rob. Thank you so much for coming on and tearing this movie apart with us. It was good fun. Uh, you've got some shows coming up, I believe. 
Yes, yes, we do. Um, we're bringing back uh, Shakespeare Aliens uh, after its success at Theatre Works in Melbourne uh, in January, earlier this year. We're bringing it back uh, in October, but there'll be more information. Go check out uh, Shakespeare Aliens on Instagram or Shakespeare Aliens on Facebook to keep up to date with uh, where we will be and what time. But yeah, Shakespeare Aliens back in Melbourne in October. I'm very excited to return to that show uh, it's a lot of fun uh, manually pressing all the shooty shooty noises and all the boomy boomy noises oh I do do mm. some of those as well yeah oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a, yeah it's good fun um, and 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 uh, you've got a bunch of other stuff as well you've got a new podcast <gasps> I do I do I know I know you do podcasts <laughs> well yeah I'm, I'm I'm meant to do but my main podcast I don't think we've recorded a podcast in about 12 months <laughs> we'll do another one soon we'll do another one at some point um so yeah a friend of mine uh, kevin yank and i have just decided to chat about all things star trek i'm a, a oh. star trek fan but i'm not as devout into star trek as i am to say doctor who or mm. or star wars uh kevin is a massive star trek fan so i'm learning a lot of his uh knowledge so yes yeah, uh subspace radio so if you go to subspace.fm uh you can listen to all our podcasts there we've only done three so far we've ended up uh, the last three episodes of um, Strange New Worlds, we reviewed that. We're going to take a bit of a break until Lower Decks comes back on later in the month. So I've got to watch the first two seasons of Lower Decks. Absolutely love Lower Decks. Until Strange New Worlds came out, it was the best uh, new Star Trek. Mm. I do remember you saying uh, uh, Lower Decks is good. So I'm looking forward to uh, checking checking that out. All the links to that are in the episode description, plus links to our socials. We're on all the things as well. Facebook, um, Instagram, uh, Letterboxd, uh, personal accounts, Zach's on there sometimes. All the things are in the episode description, plus our Patreon, where we are still doing our Nicolas cage Arama. The first four episodes out of the six are up right now. Uh, yeah, Mandy, our review of his glorious art house. How would you describe it, Zach? <laughs> Uh, I would say you get a painting and then you cover it in blood and hit it with an axe repeatedly. Yes. That's how I'd describe that movie. Sounds about right. That's Mandy, and that is up on Patreon right now. And uh, the next one we're doing is David Lynch's Wild at Heart. Mm. David Lynch and Nicolas Cage. What could go wrong? <laughs> mm. I, d- I just quickly also want to thank uh, the That's Not Canon Productions. Yes. A uh, little thing. I've recently been listening to The Glass Cannon podcast which is a D podcast mm-hmm. i uh went back and started listening to those episodes and they have a great like they've edited their very first episode to have an updated intro that like explains how far they've come and all that it was pretty good so um no but it was it was good it was good i really enjoyed it yeah and always a big thanks to our network that's not canon productions for everything that they do uh zach i'm picking next week's thing Ah, then I'd better tell you some movies to choose from. Yes, please. Okay, <laughs> if you if you could go through puberty real quick <laughs> uh, as I tell you these, that would be great. Maybe Rob can help you out. We have Apocalypse Now, Redux. What? Yeah. Which is the extended cut of a classic war film. Why, why, why is a director's cut on the list of options? I don't know. Well, we get these options together, so one of us put it there. <laughs> um, we have Original Sin. Which is an erotic thriller Ooh. with An- Antonio Banderas. Oh Ooh, my. And Angelina Jolie. Oh, oh. If it's got Antonio Banderas, I'm invested, hey. especially in an erotic thriller. I mean, Banderas can have chemistry with anyone, but <laughs> Jolie? <laughs> All right. We have The Princess Diaries. Aww. And Hathaway is an awkward teenager who suddenly learns she's heir to a European kingdom. That's a good film. I grew up watching that film a lot. That, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. It's classic. And then we have Rush Hour 2. Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker team up to fight crime and make jokes. Those are three popular... Well, not popular. Those are three interesting options. Yeah. What, what do you mean? There was four options there. Yeah, the first one. <laughs> <laughs> the first one doesn't count. Fair enough. Have I seen Rush Hour 2? I can't remember. I've seen one of the Rush Hour films. I, I think I've seen the first one. I thought it was pretty good. And Princess to Diaries is really good fun. I like that film a lot. But here's my thinking. We've been doing, like, 
big movies all month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, Final Fantasy, we did Cats and Dogs, we did Jurassic Park, we did this one. We've done so many big movies, and, like, Princess Diaries, it's almost too recognisable, I feel like, at this point. That is true. So you're thinking about doing Rush Hour 2, right? Well, here's the thing is, I've got to watch the first one and I don't want to. <laughs> oh, no, please. Why don't we do something that is erotic uh, and stars uh, <laughs> Daddy Banderas? Uh, I do like Daddy Banderas. Uh, have you seen any of these, Rob? I have seen Princess Diaries um, and... I think I've seen Rush Hour 2. Yeah, I haven't seen Original Sin. That kind of sort of like came and went with a whimper. Um, <laughs> the Rush Hour films have obviously stuck around a lot. Princess Diaries stuck around. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Original Sin is one of those ones that sort of like came and went with a whimper. So that might be fun to revisit and see why it uh, faded into obscurity. Yeah, I think that'd be fun. Or maybe it's a diamond in the rough. Who knows? Oh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's the answer to every movie where we go, oh, maybe this will be good. <laughs> the eternal optimism of Zach and the, uh, the the harsh, cold reality of Sandro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it will be good. No. All right. Uh, we'll do Original Sin next week. I apologize to everyone. Um, let's... <laughs> I do love The Princess Diaries, but, you know, we've done so many big movies, and that's a Disney film. You know, we need to, we, we, we need to do something small, I think. Yeah, we've done way too much Disney. <laughs> yeah, you guys started off really, like, hard, because the only stuff that was releasing at the start of the year was, like, Disney telly movies and stuff like that, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Zetus, Lapidus, they were the best. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, we'll wrap it up with the best quote from Planet of the Apes 2001 or the entire franchise because there weren't any memorable lines in this movie. Rob, what's your favourite quote? Well, my favourite quote is the one I make up in my head and that's Mark Wahlberg as Leo Davison going, I'm a pilot, Captain. You gotta let me fly. <laughs> my favourite would be, a, oh, you never send a monkey to do a man's job. <laughs> uh, my one specifically directed... At the screenwriters and scriptwriters for this movie. Oh, wow, okay. I'm all for free speech, as long as they keep their mouths shut. Wah, 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 wah. wah. <laughs> <laughs>